Um, as bad as last class was with uh, the subject matter, today is equally good on the other extreme. There are several main characters in church history that to me really stand out and they go against the status quo, they go against the Catholic Church, they take a stand, and today is one of those days. <clears throat> so this is more, much more interesting, much more exciting for me. Um, who, who are some people, by the way, some of these I, I would be very happy if a couple of you did, uh, or if one of you did your paper, your research paper on this person today that we're going to be looking at. But who are some people that really changed the course of church history? Martin Luther. Martin Luther. He has to be in that list. Who's, who's someone else? We heard a lot about him a few weeks ago when we had uh, the pastor with all the Bibles here. Mm -hmm. Tyndale. Tyndale, William Tyndale, no question. Um, he was, he, to me, he's uh, even more than John Wycliffe that we're going to look at today. To me, Tyndale is, well, there's a reason he's called, no, I'm sorry, it's John Wycliffe called the Morning Star of the Reformation, but William Tyndale is, I think, as great of a man in church history as you want to find. Um, he was persecuted, he was hated, he was eventually burned at the stake, um, and he translated the Bible into English, huge portion of the Bible uh, that was so well translated that the King James translators pretty much kept what William Tyndale did. I think it's like 85 to 88% of the King James Version is basically from the Tyndale Bible, which is un unbelievable. Uh, they, they were uh, you know, committees of 54 men. William Tyndale was one man, and he was that good and that uh, well-trained and so on in languages that uh, they kept most of it. Okay, so anyway, but today is John Wycliffe. Uh, we're going to be seeing, we're going to look at this section on page 170, the Bible in the Middle Ages, and John Wycliffe is, to me, my opinion, not quite on the level of Tyndale, but certainly one of those who changed the course of history by what he saw as the need to get the Word of God into the language, the common language of the people. What's the, what's the big word for that? The common starts with a V. The common language. Vernacular. The vernacular, the common vernacular of the people. And um, for hundreds, for centuries, the Catholic Church had kept the Bible out of the hands of the people. Literally, as we're going to talk about here at the beginning, literally to the point of forbidding anybody to read the Bible. <clears throat> Remember the idea that uh, the beasts were not allowed on the holy mount, and the common people are not allowed to touch the Bible. I mean, that's out of their league. And the only people who can interpret the Bible, of course, is the Catholic Church, which makes uh, them the authority to uh, tell the people how to interpret the Bible. And so John Wycliffe went against that, I mean, right in the teeth of the Catholic Church and stood on that, and he produced the Bible, a lot of it in English. Um, and so e even though what he, a lot of, like he wasn't, didn't have the same texts and so on necessarily exactly that he should have had, and I wish we, it'd be nice if he would have had them. What he did do was taking a stand against the Catholic Church on this issue, and that's why he is called the Morning Star of the Reformation. <clears throat> uh, he's the first one, I think, to really <clears throat> go in the face of the Catholic Church on this issue of the Bible, the Morning Star of the Reformation. Now, um, there's another point I want to make before we get into this. Um, and I think I touched on this last week, but it certainly applies here, and a couple of you won't like it, because you're not <laughs> Englishmen. Um, but uh, two of these great early uh, translators and early uh, ones who stood against the Catholic Church were Englishmen. So, I don't mean you don't like it, it just doesn't mean as much to you as it does to me. Um, but, but they were Englishmen. John Wycliffe and William Tyndale 
both coming from England and taking this stand against the Catholic Church, um, there was something different about England that uh, they, they, the people in general had a little bit more understanding of several things. I mean, there's a number of things you could talk about. Languages, they, they, they believed in being learned in languages. They also didn't just bow down to the Catholic Church every time something was said. Uh, in general, they wanted things written down. They wanted their laws written down. Blackstone, uh, his writings, and John Locke, and many of these, they just had a different mentality. And so uh, that, I think, is also a part of why these Englishmen then were translating the Bible. They believed in having the, the Bible in the language of the people, more so than many of the other countries in, in Europe at that time. Okay, so here on page 170, first we want to look at just the idea that Rome, the Roman church, forbade people in getting the Bible. It was at great difficulty and cost that Christians had the Bible during the Dark Ages. The Catholic Church repeatedly forbade the people to have the scriptures. They burned the scriptures. They, they persecuted the uh, people who had the scriptures or were caught with the, the, the scriptures. It would literally come to the point later where they would persecute people who even had English writings <laughs> because that would also include uh, commentators or people writing their notes about the Bible and so on. Uh, they didn't want anything from England that was written down and, and, of course, would discuss the Bible. In the year 1215, Pope Innocent III, uh, he was, remember this uh, same Pope that we mentioned last week, or last class period, who had uh, persecuted uh, in a very real way, started the Inquisition and persecuted, not started, but he was in very much, uh, he brought the Inquisition probably to its max, and uh, persecuted true Christians, Innocent declared that the beast touching the holy mount was to be stoned to death, so simple and uneducated men were not to touch the Bible or venture to preach its doctrines. So this is their reasoning for why simple people, common people, were not allowed to touch the Bible. That's why common people were not allowed to be preachers. They had to be approved by the Catholic Church. There were several councils and synods that forbade the common person to have and to study the Bible. A couple are mentioned there in 1229, the Council of Toulouse forbade the laity. Laity is the layman, uh, not the clergy. The op opposite of the laity is the clergy. Forbade the laity to possess or read the vernacular translations of the Bible, saying, we prohibit the permission of the books of the Old and New Testament to laymen, except perhaps they might desire to have the Psalter Who's that? Psalms, David's writings. Or some breviary for the divine service or the hours of the Blessed Virgin Mary for devotion. So they can have a few little scraps of the Bible as devotion, expressly forbidding their having the other parts of the Bible translated into the vulgar tongue. So they... The clergy are the educated, and the clergy are the privileged ones. And everybody else, you can tell, is just kind of pushed away and just get out of here. You're the common man, the vulgar tongue. <laughs> uh, they definitely treated the, the lower classes as such. So, councils, synods. Let's mention also the Council of Trent in 1546 putting the Bible on its list of prohibited books. You're not allowed to read it unless you have a license from a Roman Catholic bishop or inquisitor. And there we even see the actual quote from this council stating such. It shall not be lawful for anyone to print or to have printed any books whatsoever dealing with sacred doctrinal matters without the name of the author, or in the future to sell them or even to have them in possession unless they have first been examined and approved by the ordinary under penalty of anathema and fine prescribed by the last council of the latter. And that's mentioned also uh, towards the top of this page. So the uh, Catholic Church... Oh, so 
certain uh, translators and certain writers would publish and make books without their name on them. Okay, that's a smart thing to do if you're going to be persecuted for publishing things. You don't put your name on it. Just put these things out there. William Tyndale, by the way, was one of those that did such, and many others. Um, so in spite of the attempt by the Roman Catholic Church, believers distributed the Bible throughout the world, in fact, and especially even in Europe. And so page 172 is a listing of some of these Bibles, which, by the way, most of these uh, have very, very few copies. Isn't it <clears throat> amazing? I just love the fact that a couple weeks ago when we had all those Bibles set up for display, how many different names and types of Bibles there are. Uh, and there's bits and pieces of all so many of these old Bibles. Uh, people have always felt, Christians have always felt, that it's important to have the Word of God in their own language. What, what good does the Word of God do if you can't understand it, if you can't read it? Um, when, when I was a little kid uh, in the Amish, you're, you grow up speaking Pennsylvania Dutch. And then when you go to school, you learn two other languages. You learn English and you learn German. And Pennsylvania Dutch and German are very different. Um, as a little kid, I remember going to church. And, you know, I was seven years old when we left the Amish church. So to that point, I hadn't learned any, any uh, German yet. I didn't know how to read the Bible. I knew how to read in English because I had been taught that in school. But I remember, and the preachers would get up, and for some reason it was the thing to, I don't know why, but it was the thing to do to not preach in Pennsylvania Dutch, but to preach kind of in German. So I'm a little kid. They don't have junior church or Sunday school or anything. You sit there for hours and hours on a Sunday. The songs are in German. The preaching is mostly in German. I didn't understand a word they ever said. And it was expected. It was just understood that all the little kids just sat there and went to sleep or had some toys to play with while you're sitting there. There's no nurseries. <laughs> it was crazy. About halfway through the service, you know, they'd bring out the, the cookies and water. I don't know. We always had, we had church cookies, Khmer cookies, which means church cookies. And they'd bring these huge cookies out and pass them out to the little kids, you know, eight years old and under or something like that. So I always got cookies. And then they'd have a nice big glass of water. And they'd start it on this end, and all the little kids would just take a drink and pass it along to the next kids all the way down the row. And if you were lucky, you got more cookie at the bottom of the glass yet if you were down towards the end, you know. Sounds great, doesn't it? But, but uh, I literally never understood what the preacher said. And I remember a few times uh, <laughs> we'd get home, you know, and I'd do something dumb or something bad or whatever, and Dad would say, uh, ah, how did he say it in German? Anyway, basically he'd say, didn't you hear what the preacher said today? You know, I didn't answer, but I'm like, no, I didn't actually. I didn't understand what he didn't understand a word he said. Well, what good does it do if you don't understand it? Anyway, it just, it's still weird to me. Why didn't they just preach? And, but I, I know it's probably the same type of thinking that it showed them as, for some reason, they felt a little smarter. Another problem with that, big problem with that, is that the, the language that they read in the Bible wasn't even a language that they were really familiar with. You understand that? So, all week you speak in Pennsylvania Dutch. That's your common language. Everybody understands that, but it's, it wasn't even a written language, which is another weird thing. You, you, we never had language classes for that language. But when you went to school, you learned English and you learned German. So uh, while you're learning those languages, those are your second languages, you hardly ever use them. You use German when you read the Bible a little bit every day. Dad, at least in our family, Dad even then would, would read a couple verses in the Bible. We had a prayer book, and he would have a certain prayer that he prayed every day. Um, that'd put you to sleep, too. But uh, so you read the Bible a little bit here and there. 
you use it on Sundays, and then you use English basically every day uh, in interactions with the outside world, you know, but mostly you use Pennsylvania Dutch. So then when you read the Bible, you really never understand what the Bible says because the Bible is interpreted, same as the Catholics, the Bible is interpreted by the preachers. And constantly they stress, you know, they have their pet doctrines and they stress those things. And um, they don't really even understand it. And it's the same thing here with the Catholics. Very similar in this way. Um, that uh, they really, a lot of people didn't even know what the Bible said. When people began to have the Bible in their own language, it opened their eyes up. And it's exactly what happened to my dad. Um, it was illegal. Legal. It was against the rules of the Amish to have a Bible in English. So my dad, somewhere, he got an interest in what the Bible says in other languages. And so he, he got a, a Bible. Somebody gave him a Bible that in one column it had German, and the column right next to it was in English. And so he would read the verses he'd always heard and known since he was a kid in German, and then he saw it in English, and it had a different meaning than what he had ever understood before about the grace of God, about the hope. Uh, the Bible talks about our hope that's within us if we're saved. Well, they always thought that meant you hope. I hope to get to heaven. The hope that's within me, yeah, the, the Hoffnung, that's, you're hoping to get to heaven someday. And it has nothing to do with that. So he found out, you know, a lot of verses like that. And the gift of God, he always thought yeah, that meant uh, God's grace, the gift uh, in German is translated having to do with the grace of God. Well, he found out that that word is the word gift. Well, a gift you can't work for, it's free. And so on. A lot of things began to take on new meaning when he saw it in the English. And so it's the exact same thing here. And the funny thing is it, it was in, in English here as well. Wycliffe took the Bible, and instead of the people just reading it in Latin that they didn't even understand, they began to see it in English. And it opened their eyes, and it opened their minds, and for the first time, across Europe, people began to question the Catholic Church. Question. And it took a long time for it to come out, but uh, they began to question. And I just love the fact that as all these countries... Individuals in each of these countries began to translate, saying, hey, we got to get the Bible in our country also in the vernacular of the people. So the Dutch and the Old Norse and the French and the German and the Swedish and the Arabic and the Italian and Spanish and Bohemian versions, all these different languages of the, uh, the Bible was translated into, and people got them in their natural tongue. It's an amazing thing. It's a wonderful thing that happens when the Bible is put out there in the natural tongue of the people. All right, so go to page 174. John Wycliffe is as <laughs> instrumental as anybody in starting this and getting this idea uh, popularized where people really began to have a desire for the Scripture in their own language. Okay, there's a good bit of this is about his life itself. I just want to touch on a couple things. Um, there's on um, page 175 an overview of his life. Wycliffe himself was uh, born in 1324, and he was educated at Oxford. He was a very educated man. Um, he was a doctor in theology. He was, had a master's and a doctor's degree uh, in Bible languages. Uh, you that are studying languages, Bible languages, um, you're in a long line of honorable people. <laughs> I'm not saying you're not honorable if you don't, but uh, that's a very noble thing to do, I believe. So he was uh, beginning in 1377. He's about 50 years old already. He's fiercely persecuted by the Roman Catholic authorities in England as well as by the Pope in Rome. Uh, he was evicted from Oxford University for denying the Roman dogma of transubstantiation. He retired to Lutterworth and he produced there a massive amount of writing until his death in 1384. 57 Latin works 
were written in four years. The first English Bible was completed and uh, inter, not interspersed, dispersed, there you go, um, all across England as a result of his work. Okay, I do want to take a little bit of time and see what his doctrine was. I think it's very interesting to study what people believed. And of course, what do you think the Catholic encyclopedias have to say about him? <laughs> Real nice things, right? Uh, he's a man guilty of uh, causing sedition in the Roman Empire. Uh, he's a traitor. He's this. He's that. They have the worst names possible for these kinds of people. Well, let's see what he believed and see if we can identify with anything. He was a Catholic priest. Hey, everything was great when he was a Catholic priest. But he began to preach against Rome's errors in his mid-30s. He didn't reject Rome all at once, but gradually grew in his understanding of Scripture. He exposed many of their errors. Here's a couple things. First, he believed that the Bible is the sole authority for faith and practice. Here's a quote from him. Believers should ascertain for themselves what are the true matters of their faith by having the scriptures in a language which all may understand. Okay, so you see why Wycliffe is so important to this issue of Bibles in the Middle Ages. Wycliffe believed the Bible to be the Word of God without error. <clears throat> One of his major works is called On the Truth of Sacred Scripture, a defense of the authority and inerrancy of the Bible. Boy, I love that. Uh, he believed that the Bible is totally, uh, completely from one end to the other. It's inerrant. He testified, it is impossible for any part of the Holy Scriptures to be wrong. In Holy Scripture is all the truth. One part of Scripture explains another. Boy, 1 Timothy chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is given. He just believed that if the Bible has one error, it's not the Bible anymore. So it must be, it has to be inerrant. It has to be perfect. And he said that it is impossible for any part not to be. He also believed that the scripture was a divine exemplar conceived in the mind of God before creation and before the material scriptures were written down. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, Psalm 119, 89. From beginning, before the world was even created, God's word was already there. And it was written down for us. But in the mind of God, it was always there. That's a great point. I, I agree with that. How about this? He rejected the doctrines of transubstantiation and indulgences. Well, of course, we believe that. The Bible teaches that very clearly. <clears throat> uh, against these uh, doctrines of the Catholics. Number five, he taught that the aposto uh, apostolic churches have only elders and deacons. Preachers and deacons, and declared his conviction that all orders above these had been introduced by Caesarean pride. I'm not sure exactly what he meant by that, but uh, there's no other order. There's no cardinals, there's no popes, there's no, uh, you know, all the positions in the Catholic Church. Well, again, uh, he was right. Wycliffe was very bold against the Pope, containing it is blasphemy to call any head of the church save Christ alone. <clears throat> so he was against the papacy, and he uh, believed that Christ is the head of the church. Well, Colossians is pretty clear on that, that in all things he, Jesus, might have the preeminence, and he is the head of the church, the body of Christ. Colossians chapter 1 clearly says that. Here's some other quotes from, from uh, Wycliffe. And the great thing about Wycliffe, by the way, as much as he wrote, there were, there were writings scattered all throughout England and throughout uh, the rest of the European continent of his writings. Of course, a lot of those were destroyed 
a lot of persecution uh, against his writings. Uh, and so a lot of his writings were destroyed. But because he wrote so much, I mean, it was so voluminous going out everywhere that there are still copies of his writings today, which is really, really neat. We don't have any of those in our library. They'd be, they'd be worth a lot of money. But we do have some other old things, and we have a lot of other good books about his writings. But we do know a lot of what he said. Here's a couple of quotes. It is supposed and with much probability that the Roman pontiff is the great Antichrist. <laughs> okay, uh, that's pretty blunt. Um, anybody not know what he means by that? <laughs> uh, it's pretty obvious. How then shall any sinful wretch who knows not whether he be damned or saved constrain men to believe that he is head of holy church? Right? If, how can the Pope say, I don't know, I'm hoping that I'm good enough to go to heaven? And Popes would often say something like that. Uh, in, in the, on the best of days, I wonder if I'm, if I'm actually going to heaven. And I'm trying to do my... If the Pope doesn't know if he's damned or saved, how can he be the head of the Holy Church? Unbelievable. Here's another quote. He said, the Antichrist, referring to the Pope, puts many thousand lives in danger for his own wretched life. Why is he not a fiend stained foul with homicide who though a priest fights in such a cause? <laughs> How can you stand for the Pope when he himself puts lives in danger? And of course, that had to do with persecution. So he was very bold against the Pope. Next, number seven, he also taught and believed, this is still his doctrine, that men have the right to have the Bible in their own languages. And here's what sets him apart. Remember this characteristic of Wycliffe, and that is that he believed people should have the Bible in their language. He was willing to endure the wrath of the Catholic authorities by translating the scriptures into English. When he began the translation work, the Pope in Rome issued bulls against him, statements against Wycliffe. And Wycliffe just came right back at the Pope. Look at some of the questions he asks uh, of the Pope. Um, he said, uh, Do you know whom you blaspheme? Did not the Holy Ghost give the word of God at first in the mother tongue of the nations to whom it was addressed? Why do you speak against the Holy Ghost? You say that the church of God is in danger from this book? How can that be? Is it not from the Bible only that we learn that God has set up such a society as a church on the earth? Is it not the Bible that gives all her authority to the church? Is it not from the Bible that we learn who is the builder and sovereign of the church? What are the laws by which is she, uh, she is to be governed and the rights and privileges of her members? Without the Bible, what charter has the church to show for all these? It is you who place the church in jeopardy, but by hiding the divine warrant, the missive royal of her king, Jesus, for the authority she wields and the faith she enjoins. Man, powerful. Very powerful. All right, there's also some evidence that he rejected infant baptism later in life. And so, of course, that sets him up for all kinds of battles against the Catholic Church. Okay, go to page 179 there. Let's move on. Uh, God protected John Wycliffe from the, uh, the uh, Catholic authorities over and over. He used some, some people to do it. And it's, what's interesting about Wycliffe's life, as much as he was persecuted and hated and on the run throughout much of his life in hiding and so on, he had friends in high places, God gave him certain individuals who protected him, even, even all the way up to the Queen of England, who protected him. And of all things, uh, John Wycliffe died a natural death. Um, it was John Wycliffe who, remember about 30 years after his death, his bones were dug up. And then they burned his bones. <laughs> uh, they hated him so much. But he actually died a natural death. And you can picture John Wycliffe in heaven at that time laughing at the fools digging his bones out of the ground and, and burning them. Okay, so there's several uh, major uh, players in the situation. People that God put there to protect 
John Wycliffe. The first is John of Gaunt. He's a uh, he's a uh, he's basically the ruler of England. He was basically a tutor to the to the young king Richard II. And his armor, he was a knight. His armor is displayed in the Tower of London even today still. Um, six foot nine inches tall. He's a big man. And he protected John Wycliffe um, as, as having, by him having these connections to the throne itself. He eventually turned his back on Wycliffe, but God used him uh, for many years to protect Wycliffe. Another protector was Queen Joan. She was the wife of Edward III. He was known as the Black Prince. When Edward died, she became the queen mother to her son, Richard II. That's also the same son that John of Gaunt was protecting. <clears throat> 1378, the enemies of Wycliffe called him to stand before a tribunal of bishops. Wycliffe was accused of spreading heresies, and the one who kept them and befuddled their plans was this queen mother, forbidding them to pass sentence upon Wycliffe. He was guilty, according to the Catholics, of passing out uh, the writings and so on, and she protected him. Queen Anne also, this would be later in life, um, when Richard, that, Richard II, that boy, grew up and his wife would become Queen Anne, she also assisted Wycliffe. And uh, anyway, so a lot of Bibles were spread out in different languages throughout Europe because of her protection. She loved Wycliffe's doctrine. You see that spelling there on page 180. You'll see lots of spellings for the name Wycliffe, and that's not a mistake. That's in different languages. They were written differently. Many of Wycliffe's works that were completely destroyed in England survived in copies in Bohemia. And this queen, she died in 1394, a young age of 27. But she protected uh, John Wycliffe as a young uh, mother, young queen. All right, um, then in 1378, there was a great schism, the papal schism, where you have two popes and even three popes during this time, also, Wycliffe was uh, able to uh, write a lot and to pass out his writings pretty much uninhibited for a few years because the popes were too busy uh, dealing with each other and didn't have time to deal with him. Um, note down also, or make a note there in your book, page 180, Wycliffe was concerned about missions. Missions. He had copies of the handwritten scriptures produced and distributed not only in England, but also across Europe. And these multiplied widely. We know that because of the many copies that uh, are found and have been found in many countries in Europe. All right, then you can read some things about uh, him towards the end of his life. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about the Wycliffe Bible just for a bit. Uh, a wonderful, uh, oh, how would you say, uh, this, this Bible being produced in English is a game changer. Uh, this is a turning point in church history right here. His greatest influence was through the Bible that he translated. That's uh, very significant. It's the English Bible that bears his name that is the real morning star. He's called that, but it's his Bible that is the key there. We must remember there's no Oxford theologian whose words people memorize and bore in their hearts through persecution, torture, and the state. Wycliffe, what did he do? He gave the Word of God to people and in their language. Only the Word of God can convert sinners and transform lives. It's the appearance of the English Bible that brings about the dawning of the great English Reformation that was to follow. And you can see some details of that. The New Testament was completed in 1380. The Old Testament in 1382, and he died in 1384. Um, 
Anyway, there's those who say that he did not translate much of the Bible. Uh, that's ridiculous. There were people who were contemporaries of his, including John Fox. Is, uh, he wrote Fox's Book of Martyrs. And a number of other very dependable historians who say that he himself personally did at least part of the translation and he was responsible for all of it. Okay, so there's some things. Yeah, where did his translation come from? Here's the bad part. He translated from the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate. What was the Latin Vulgate? Obviously, it's in Latin. That should tell you something. Who used the Latin Vulgate? Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church. That's, the Latin Vulgate is the Bible of the Catholic Church all through the Middle Ages. It's based on the wrong text, and, and of course it's in Latin. So what did he do? He just simply took the Bible that the Catholic Church used and translated it into English. Okay, now, it's not good enough. King James Version was not translated from anything close to those same texts. <laughs> but the step that he took in going this direction, uh, getting into the hands of the people, is still monumental. So don't, don't be... Uh, you know, too upset or uh, depressed about that. You know, oh, well, he, why did... Look, he translated the Bible into the language of the, of the common people, and that was a wonderful thing. He, another, another big part of his translation, and this is hard to, to understand unless you learn Latin and you learn uh, how the Vulgate and how other translations were not straightforward. And Tyndale and Wycliffe and the King James translators, they in their translations were very straightforward. Uh, immediately, if you read the book of Mark, it's a great example of that. Mark chapter 1, I, I don't remember how many times, it's many times where it says, straightway Jesus did this, and then he did this, and immediately he went into a boat and... What's the point? It's, it's just really, it was definite. This is what happened next. And it's very straightforward. And, and these translators all were like that in English. And I think that's a great thing. They were just very bold about the way that they translated it. As it puts it here on page 183, the language of the Wycliffe version is simple and forceful and certainly laid the foundation for other Bibles in English. And here's a couple of examples. Uh, it just puts it out there. Says it like it is. The Wycliffe Bible in John 11, verses 8 through 12. The disciples said to him, Master, now the Jews sought and for to stone thee, and goest thou thither? Jesus answered, Whether there be not twelve hours of the day, if any man wander in the night, he stumbleth. He stumbleth. For light is not in him. He saith these things, and after these things he saith to him, Lazarus, our friend, sleepeth, but I go to raise him from sleep. Therefore his disciples said, Lord, if he sleepeth, he shall be safe. So it's just very straightforward. And that was a new thing. That was a, not a common practice in the Latin Vulgate for sure. Okay? So uh, his Bible is, even though it's based on the wrong text, even though it's just a translation of the Latin Vulgate, it's a monumental step. Very important to understand. Okay, any questions on that so far? Okay, now let's talk about his followers. His followers are called the Lollards, page 184. The Lollards. And we'll just kind of summarize through this. But uh, the Lollards are the followers, generally the followers of John Wycliffe. Um, the term Lollards, it comes from before John Wycliffe, but it basically means... The, the evangelical men, or there's a lot of different, the Bible men, those who studied and knew the Bible, that basically what they were is they were traveling preachers. They were preachers who took the Bible and not only spread the Bible, but preached the Bible. And uh, he had a very loyal group of men who did these things. And I don't mean, 
you know, that he even necessarily knew all of them. It wasn't like that. It was just a bunch of believers who said, wow, we have the Bible in our language and we're going to spread it and we're going to preach it. And it wasn't really an organized group, but it was anybody who believed these things. And so a lot of uh, Bible preachers went out, missionaries, really, went all across Europe uh, into these countries where the Catholic Church's stranglehold was even greater than it was in England. Um, Bohemia. Anybody know anything about Bohemia? Okay, probably not, right? You're like, oh, where, where in the world's that? Uh, European country. Uh, obviously, not, uh, it's not even named that anymore, and I don't remember what it is now. But uh, these countries where these Bible preachers had a great influence, and uh, we can really be thankful for that. So there's a number of things that it's pretty interesting about the Lollers. It's kind of a term that's like the term Waldensians or the Paulicians. It's not really a, a, an organized group of people. It's Rather, it's people who believe the same thing. There were many types of people who were called lollards. Page 186 names four kinds of lollards. Look it up. Make sure you're able to identify these four. Tavern lollards. <laughs> Look uh, here, this is funny. Um, John Faucus of Coventry. He got in trouble when he refused to make an offering to an image of Mary. He said, Her head shall be whore white before I offer to her what is but a block. If he, the image, could speak to me, I would give it a half penny worth of ale. <laughs> uh, you want an offering? Here, here's, a little, here's a little wine for you. Revolutionary Lollards, Catholic Lollards, and then, of course, Baptistic Lollards. Accepting the Bible as the authority, expecting Christ to return at any time, rejecting infant baptism, Baptist position on sacraments and ordinances. And uh, so there's a number of references to these Baptistic Lollards. I'm pretty sure that Pastor Armacos next semester when he does Baptist history um, I'm almost positive that he covers this section of uh, Baptistic Lollards. And so great stories here. Have you had that? So am I right there? So that's what I thought. Okay, um, lots of hand copies of the Bible. Imagine that. Handwritten copies of Scripture. Um, they believed it. <clears throat> they believed it. They really put their life on the line, believing uh, that the Word of God needed to be in the, in the language of the people. There were all kinds of laws made against the Lollards. There were all kinds of persecutions against the Lollards. Uh, some of this persecution, a lot of it, uh, as far as uh, torture, was the burning at the stake and different methods of burnings. Um, and here again, the, the disgusting things... Um, one of these here, a couple pages over, uh, page 200, page 200, uh, Sir John Oldcastle, um, he was hung on chains over a fire and literally roasted to death. And um, all the way to the end, they say the last thing he said, they heard him say was, Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Um, he, he's in glory. He's in heaven. And, and many, many people like this. So uh, persecutions in the 1400s and in the 1500s, a lot of this information of the persecutions comes from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, John Fox lived, he was a contemporary here, and he knew the stories of these people, and he names them in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, that hall of faith that's in Hebrews chapter 11 and that great cloud of witness in Hebrews chapter 12 uh, is referring to these kinds of people right here. So many lawlers were punished uh, and persecuted and the word of God was hated and burned. By the way, I skipped a bunch of pages just now, but uh, it talks about how the word of God was persecuted um, and gathered up 
huge amounts of books and literature uh, written by the Lollards, and it was persecuted, hated, burned, and it exploded. It just kept on growing and growing and growing. So we don't have a lot of the Lollards and Wycliffe's writings around today, but the Word of God didn't get uh, shut down. Um, it exploded. People's desire for the Word of God uh, was it just begun. It just was started with this morning star of the Reformation, John Wycliffe and the Lollards. Traveling preachers, page 206, all over the place. William Smith of Bristol, he was a blacksmith. Um, on and on, burned at the stake. People in London, uh, influential people, not so influential people, uh, common people. Uh, they were mocked and ridiculed for being common. Oh no, these, these are great saints. People going around preaching and carrying the word of God all over the place. England, again, a hotbed for people who not only believed the word of God, they loved the word of God, they gave their lives for the word of God. And when Tyndale comes on the scene... Um, What's the year for him again? I don't have that here. I forget when he came on the scene. But uh, England was a hotbed for getting the word of God out. And people, uh, were, they were persecuted there, but they weren't stopped in any sense. And in fact, of course, as we mentioned, it just uh, exploded from there. So a great story of John Wycliffe, the Morning Star of the Reformation, the man who gave for the first time people the, uh, the taste of having the Word of God in their own language. And then Tyndale comes along, uses better sources, better texts, and he does the same thing as John Wycliffe, and of course he'll end up losing his life for that. But uh, this is a great time coming out of the uh, Middle Ages and coming into the Reformation. Any questions? So, anybody want to do John Wycliffe in your study? There you go. I hope you do. Hope you hope it's uh, very informative. A lot of good books in the library on this time period, so take advantage of those. Okay, you're dismissed. <laughs>